Yeah, so I'm Clive, I'm from Valerius Group. I think it's a very nice thing that we are able to do these lunchtime talks. It's always very nice to hear from all of you. So today, as you guys can see, what I kind of entitled title this would be called uh, Irreversibility and Inference. And what we're going to do is try to connect ideas of reversibility with Bayesian inference. What does that even mean? Uh, we'll try to go, through, as I go through the talk, hopefully it starts to make a little bit more sense. Okay, so how I'm going to do this is basically three parts. First, I'll try to motivate the question that I'm trying to answer here. Essentially, why on earth should you listen to a lunchtime seminar on reversal process or reversal of processes? And then I'll try to pose the question more vividly. Essentially, the question of how to get a generalized recipe for reverse, reverse processes and how to do that. Um, and uh, that's where the Bayesian inference uh, framework will kind of come in. And after this, this is kind of the key takeaways for the talk. And after that, what we'll, I'll try to go through is three quick snapshots of some recent uh, results and directions that emerge from what is said in the first two parts. So that's how I'll do it. And so, yeah, I'll just jump straight into why reversibility is it's an important or interesting topic to kind of look into. And for something like this, it's key to look at something that is a good source of information on these things, reliable source. So we'll consult some demons. Okay, and these demons here will be some stuff that you might be familiar with, like Laplace's demon, right? Okay, so for those of us who don't know what Laplace's demon is, it's a kind of a metaphor or a thought experiment that was involved, involved by Laplace to kind of express the very strong reversibility that characterizes classical mechanics. And okay, essentially, how does it go? It, it goes something like this, that if there's kind of super intelligent being that we're just going to call Laplace demon that has um, a kind of cause Hamiltonian for everything that happens in the universe, taking into account everything, um, it comes out of a very grand cosmic Hamiltonian. And he also has an exact state of the universe, something with infinite precision at some point in this huge phase space. If you can identify, what, identify one point at some given time, then he will be able to trace out a unique trajectory of the entire universe according to Hamiltonian and Lagrangian uh, dynamics. So it is uh, something that emerges from something that we might prove in uh, classical mechanics, uh, Lubao theorem. And, and basically here, what is being said is really that anything, any kind of randomness that we perceive according to Laplace and um, uh, classical mechanics in general, okay, is that any kind of randomness or irreversibility that we apprehend really comes from either I don't have the cosmic Hamiltonian uh, that defines the entire universe, or I don't have infinite precision on the state. So basically it comes from ignorance. The other demon that we might be more familiar with will be Maxwell's demon. And I won't kind of hash out what exactly this thought experiment tells us, but it connects our notions of the second law, uh, basically things like the efficiency of, of an engine or why refrigerators take money to like run. Okay, um, and essentially kind of builds in this, no, connects it to the notion of information. What does this demon have that is able to consume entropy rather than produce it? Um, and essentially what's the kind of uh, upshot of this is that, again, irreversibility, um, according to Maxwell, at least with regard to this thought experiment, is connected to information and ignorance, that it's because of what the demon knows that he's, he's able to kind of decrease some entropy of some uh, situation. Okay, so some non-demonic reasons. Uh, of course, for some information theorists like us, one thing that is most obvious is if I send a message to a noisy channel, the how you are going to be able to recover what I'm trying to send you has a lot to do with reversibility as well. Foundations uh, things. Um, I think from Arthur, from the start of Arthur and Eddington, there's this relationship between the second law and thermodynamics to uh, the what sometimes called the arrow of time. Okay, whether this is actually holds is a different thing, but reversibility and the arrow of time, stuff like that, is something that's of interest to many physicists. Okay, but I think probably the most important thing is that um, one, one way to think about why reversibility is important is also to take note how the second law in a very deep way is uh, an issue for civilization, right? Um, so sometimes it's put very crudely and I think not very um, charitably that I've heard it being said by some physicists who wanna like sound really smart is that, you know, when, when corporations tell us to conserve energy, that's wrong because energy is always conserved. Okay, so that's, that's very snarky, but they'll say things like, there's no energy crisis, there's an entropy crisis. Okay, but what's their point here? Okay, their point is something like this, is that there's some relationship between irreversibility and entropy, and then 
inefficiency, right? Um, and of course, there is an energy crisis because we want to make sure that we have usable energy down the line. But in a very deep way, this is also related to the notion of entropy and efficiency and irreversibility. So, um, that all said, we know that reversibility is important to study for all these uh, myriad reasons, foundations, you know, information theory, and also about very practical reasons like the like energy uh, concerns. Um, what is what is difficult to um, to say is that we have a good notion of how to reverse some given process. Okay, so while we know that reversibility is important, reverse processes in general are not super well defined. At least there's no convention with regard to that. Uh, they're standardized across the physics community. And we can kind of look at this in a few ways. Okay, so let's start with the more simple example. Okay, let's say we have a bijective channel, uh, like as such. If we write this as a kind of stochastic matrix, it might look something like this. And what every single bijective channel that's out there can be taken as a permutation matrix when we uh, write it as a stochastic thing. So some examples of permutation matrices are like as so. Um, basically, this is where for every row and column of the matrix, there's only a single one entry out there. Okay. So in this situation, we can, I mean, it's basically uh, any stochastic matrix for which uh, the transpose is also its inverse. This is what defines a bijective channel. And if we kind of uh, put it out as a, kind of draw out the simplex and how it affects the simplex, we'll find that um, it preserves the simplex. It's the most boring situation that it just maps some vertices to some other vertices down the line. So in such a situation, a reverse process is completely unambiguous, right? We just invert the thing. We just send it back. Nothing particularly interesting happens. But this is where the easiness kind of stops in a sense. And once we start to deal with general channels, whereby uh, here we, we choose a column stochastic convention, uh, but for any kind of general kind of stochastic matrix, uh, what we will find is that because the absolute determinant is less than one in general, we'll find that the simplex, the kind of state space is now changed. Okay, And now, Notice that because some information has been kind of lost or like squeezed into the state space, uh, recall that inversion generally is no longer a valid stochastic process, right? What happens is that because everything is one to one, um, states that are coming from, from here are going to map to the original simplex, but anything that's outside of this, uh, this space is going to map outside of a uh, normalized situation. Okay, so um, yeah, so some information is lost, and inversion in general is not going to be a physically valid process. Right. And the most extreme case would be something like erasure. That I wipe out all the information. This would be a situation whereby all the, if you are going with the column stochastic convention, every column is the same column. And what you even, you, you immediately notice that this is singular. We can't even invert. So there's no kind of notion of inversion uh, in this case. And here's where the kind of simplex just goes down to an infinitesimal point. So. So inversion is not a valid physical process in general, and there are even such certain situations that, um, like erasure, which should be a physically valid thing, like I just give me a state, I just throw it out all the time, and I give you some other fixed state. Um, and inversion doesn't exist. And of course, with regard to the quantum channels, uh, a bijective situation will be a, like a unitary channel, and the general situation will be a CPTP map, and erasure would be the same thing except now you're giving me a quantum state, I throw it out and I give you some kind of fixed um, other quantum state, no matter what you give. So if we can only reverse process, uh, process and this um, the kind of point that has been already made, is that if we can only reverse processes that are bijective, that's kind of um, uninspiring, right? It's we don't learn anything about irreversibility at all. Or the situations whereby it's completely uninteresting, we have it, but the situations that are interesting, we don't have any kind of recipe. So can, can we define reverse processes in general in some sense? And this is where we might want to kind of take a hint from the sort of uh, 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 metaphors that we've seen before, whereby physics, uh, that reversal may not just be about the physical process, but about some kind of prior information. Yeah, so in the spirit of this, uh, we could really consult people like Thomas Bayes and more recently Satoshi Watanabe, was using Bayesian tools to speak about conditional probability in physics. And so what, what uh, this basically goes to is that how do we kind of get reverse processes? We could invoke Bayes' rule to um, 
characterize these reverse processes and then understand uh, irreversibly as a whole. So how does this work out? Okay, um, basically here when we talk about using Bayes rule, when it's a kind of a classical uh, process, uh, we can use the kind of classical Bayes rule that we, we are familiar with. But with regard to a quantum channel, we are, we'll be invoking this object called the PETS recovery map. Okay, so I'm not going to explain what this is at this point, but just know that this uh, particular object is going to feature a lot in our discussion as we go down, uh, whereby you can kind of think of it as a kind of quantum version of the base, of classical base rule. Okay, so just so that we're all on the same page, we've got base rule. Um, let me just go through, it, go through it with you. So this sometimes what we might see when we think of base rule, uh, what might be called the kind of Wikipedia version. But as Watanabe pointed out, this version of looking at it may not be the best way of thinking about it. Um, what is better is if, okay, let's say you're given some conditional probability of A given B, right? If you want to get the probability of B given A, Watanabe puts out to you that you still need some object PB. You have to invoke some kind of reference in order to understand this particular object. And depending on what you choose over here, this object is going to in general change, right? And of course, because you know, we're physicists or something, uh, we change the other Greek letters just for our notation, okay, because we use PN for other stuff. Okay, so, but the point here is that here when we talk about phi, we are really talking about a forward process that is mapping some initial state I to some final state F. And what we want to get is some reverse process that we're going to denote as phi hat gamma, and gamma here is the reference part. So I'll ask when we're thinking, okay, but what about this thing in the denominator? That's just the propagation and you can get it from these two objects. But the important thing is that a reverse process in general only needs the forward map, but also needs some kind of reference prior. We need some kind of prior information uh, to invoke this reference prior, uh, re reverse process. Here. So um, just a familiar example, just so that we can kind of understand where we're coming from, is a, like a viral self-test. Okay. So a viral self-test is essentially a kind of physical mechanism, right? I take a glob of myself, I put it onto this thing, and it goes through a kind of chemical process that maps whether I'm sick to some positive result, essentially, right? So let's say that now, and of course, um, these self-tests in general are not bijective. They are, there's some kind of probability for the true positive and some probability, let's say, omega for false positive, okay? So let's say that I do the test, and this has happened to me a few times, I get a positive result, right? And now I'm asking myself, okay, so am I sick, right? That's, that's ultimately what you want to know. Can I just consult this table here? The answer is not quite, right? Um, I'm asking, how likely am I sick given that I got a positive result? This physical mechanism maps, given that I'm, uh, given that I'm sick, how likely are you going to get a positive result? It's the inverse, right? So what you're actually doing is base rule. And I don't know whether you have done this, but there will be times that you get the result and you don't believe it, and then you do another test, right? What you're, what you're really doing is a Bayesian update. You are, you're sending in the, first you have some reference prior, like I don't think I'm sick, maybe 0 0.3, right? You, you get a positive result, you kind of weight it on your sensing on these things, and it bumps up to 0 0.6. Then you're like, I will test again. And you test again, now your reference prior is 0 0.6, right? And it feeds back in, and maybe it enlarges to 0 0.8. Then you're like, okay, I'm not going to work today, for example, okay? So, and of course, if you think like you're like the second coming of Christ or something that you can't ever get sick, then you will never, no matter how many times you run the test, you'll say, I conclude that COVID isn't real or something like that, right? <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't matter what is the, the probability of a true positive or, or false positive. And of course, if you are, you know, if, uh, like unbiased at all, you just need tau to be bigger than omega and you'll be more convinced than not. Okay. So this keeps everything stochastic, which is the, one of the concerns that has been, already been brought up. And um, it also features some nice intuitions and it's fully general. You can do it for any uh, effective model of a process and also uh, with regard to some um, notion of a prior information. Okay, and so this base rule, okay, uh, um, some typical choices, it would be the uniform prior um, and also this thing called the steady state. For the case of bi-stochastic maps, these are exactly the same thing. Okay, so, um, but yeah, for thermodynamic scenarios, uh, the, what you'll find is that for things like thermal operations and things like that, what is really being assumed is steady state, which makes a lot of sense because maybe the process has been going on for a long time. Okay, 
So um, I remind you of the patch recovery map, which is supposed this is kind of quantum uh, analog of Bayes rule. And you can and notice that instead of a reference prior a distribution, we have a reference state, some kind of quantum state. And then here for uh, E, we have the thought process, some CPTV map. Okay. And just by kind of looking at the structure, you will notice some kind of similarities here with regard to the posterior and the prior um, acting in different ways. And in fact, it becomes even more obvious when you write a uh, Bayesian, um, a kind of reverse process as a matrix, if that would be your Bayesian inversion. Um, and you'll notice that they really kind of uh, um, are, are operating on the states in um, this kind of sequence. Okay. Let's try to apply these to the objects that we have seen before. For bijective channel uh, that we've seen, if we apply Bayes rule to this, we get the expected result, which is transpose. It's a bunch of math, not very uh, difficult to follow. The, the point here is that it does give us the expectation that we want when we apply Bayes rule. Okay. Um, notice something interesting is that the, here in this situation, the reverse channel doesn't actually feature the reference state at all, right? Um, it's just the transpose. It depends only on the forward channel. And uh, one of the earliest uh, results we proved was that this is if and only if, if the reverse uh, channel um, is independent of reference prior, it's, it's an if and only if with regard to whether the channel is a bijective channel. So every other thing that is not bijective would require some form of the reference prior to define this reverse process. So for the eraser channel, uh, what would be the reverse process that is given by Bayes' rule if we erase all the information, right? Um, interestingly, if you do a base rule, you'll find that what you get is for a reverse process of a erasure channel is another erasure channel. And it erases to the reference prior, which makes a lot of sense. It's basically base, base rule saying that, well, all the information is gone, so just go with your best guess, okay? So, um, so since all the information has been erased, just rely on the prior. And of course, in the middle, we'll have a kind of a, a liminal space whereby it depends both on gamma and the forward process. So um, depending on what you choose for your reference prior, this object will shift. And in general, if for example, your reference prior is a pure state, you'll actually be a pure state because you're basically saying that I'll accept nothing but this particular um, state. Okay. So notice this interesting uh, relationship between the increasing where the simplex is getting smaller and smaller uh, as, we, as we map downwards and the dependence on the reference prior as we go along from not, no dependence to maximal dependence down the line. And the same thing is done for the PETS map, except it's much more complicated. And so I won't go through the calculations there, but a, uh, the similar um, kind of arc comes through here as well. Okay, so just kind of pit stop, this midway to uh, what we're talking about here, before I go through the snapshots very quickly, is that Bayes rule and PETS map can serve as a kind of generalized recipe for reverse processes. And it does recover some very nice, uh, prior, um, some nice intuitions about the role of prior information and irreversibility. I also want to add that um, the kind of reverse processes that are out there, for example, for thermal maps and things like this, it makes sense with regard, um, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian inversion does uh, recover all these things for some very sensible reverse uh, reference priors. Yeah. So very quickly, let me just go through the three snapshots before I close. So um, here I'll first talk about reversibility and this notion of dilations. So quite immediately when, I mean, I already mentioned this idea from Laplace Demon, let's kind of think of a, a solid example. For example, let's think of Brownian motion, okay? Some kind of Brownian particle that's kind of wiggling around in some space. And we know that this is gonna be stochastic, right? It's not as if every, every time we're ever gonna predict where this Brownian particle from here goes down to here. It's gonna be some kind of stochastic process. But we also know that the reason why this particle is wobbling around is really because it's in an environment, right? It's an environment is being bombarded by certain smaller particles and air molecules. And if we had some kind of, sorry, uh, some kind of uh, understanding of, of what the environment looks like and also map in the entire kind of relevant dynamics, according to classical mechanics, we will have some kind of bijective dynamics, some kind of fully invertible, reversible uh, situation. You can think of a unitary when it comes to the quantum case, right? Um, and so this kind of combination of the environment, which you would typically sometimes be stochastic, um, and this bijective dynamics, uh, it will be called a dilation of phi A. This kind of the effective dynamics that we see the Brownian particle kind of wiggling around stochastically. 
ultimately it can always be modeled as some kind of um, from the small space kind of map it up to a bigger space and then it's kind of a bijective uh, thing going on there. Okay, and yeah, add the environment, run through a bijective dynamics, and now that trace out the environment, right? And of course, we are much more familiar with the quantum case, whereby we have a CPTB map and we have a unitary dilation or even a Stein spring dilation in your uh, environment. Okay. So once I put this point out, you might immediately ask, okay, then Clive, why do I need Bayes' rule, right? Why can't I just dilate it? I have some kind of effective dynamics here. I dilate the guy. I get the, the bijective situation with the environment and I reverse this bijective situation. And maybe I need to take into account some correlations that are formed between the, um, the, the, the uh, target system and the environment. Okay, but then after that, I trace away the environment and I get the, the reverse. Why can't I just do that, right? Okay. So that's very good, and I, I honestly didn't expect the result that we got when we kind of looked into the math of it, but what you do here is exactly what you get for Bayes' rule. Okay? Why? It's because ultimately what you need to recognize is that you, you need to take into account the correlations that's happening here, and therefore you have to postulate some notion of an initial state, okay? which would then play this role of the reference prior in some sense. So. Um, so ultimately, because of these bijective dynamics, the reason why they are becoming meaningful is because they are making correlations. If it's a quantum channel, it's going to come out with entanglement. If you want to take into account all these things that happen and therefore get a um, reasonable reverse process, what you will need to do is essentially going to be um, the same as the uh, uh, a Bayesian inversion on the same. So the same goes for the quantum case in the PETS map. And for details, you can see the paper for the very long derivations of how this makes sense. Okay, so basically here we are saying that Bayesian uh, approach is consistent with the dilation picture of uh, effective uh, channels, and this ultimately because of the role that correlations play. And someone might say that, okay, but Clive, correlations are the hardest part, right? Um, are there situations whereby we can kind of make it easier in some sense? And for those of us who work in quantum tone dynamics, you might be able to recognize that for some situations, uh, it is very easy. You kind of just throw in an uncorrelated bar in the situation. So these are um, scenarios that are interesting to study. And when is it that this collapses down to this? And we do characterize these things in the paper, and I will refer, uh, refer you guys to that if you are interested in these uh, ideas. But the, the point here is that in general, these simple cases are very are not common. Okay, they are very, very physically, um, physically significant situations, like these thermal operations. Okay. So uh, yeah, and the paper would be out soon, hopefully. Uh, it's accepted and it's currently in press and hopefully everything is hoping that it comes up before today's talk, but it didn't, so I can can give you a quote. But yeah, here's the, the name of the talk. Uh, the, the paper. Okay, so the next snapshot is has to do with the relationship between the pets and the and Bayes rule. Okay. So recall that I uh, mentioned that structurally there's a lot of similarities between these two objects, this Bayesian inversion thing, uh, classical Bayes rule and the pets recovery map as uh, kind of channels and operators. Um, and a question that you want to ask is that, okay, but Clive, you're not doing something correctly. For one thing, this is, these are matrices, these are stochastic matrices in some kind of you know, probabilistic space. But these are very different objects. These are channels and operators in a Hilbert space, right? These are, you're comparing apples to oranges, right? So it would be very nice if you could um, get quantum theory to speak in matrices and vectors instead of operators and channels so that we can compare it better. And the question is whether we can do such a thing. And uh, for people like Prof. Dagomir and Kelvin, okay, um, they're not right, you know, making indie films and stuff. They'll be talking about these quasi probabilistic things and they say, yes, we can. We can express these, um, these operators and channels as matrices and vectors. Okay, so how does this work? Basically, there's these things called quasi probability uh, representations. For those of you who um, do like Wigner negativity stuff, think about that. And you, see, you throw in all these state operators and CPTP maps, and what you can get out of it are these quasi stochastic vectors and matrices. Why the quasi stochastic is that even though like some um, uh, quantum state row will then be mapped to some vector or, on row, all these entries sum up to one, there might be some negative uh, uh, entries inside that probability distribution. 
And the, the point here is that these QPRs are then defined by some kind of frame and dual operators. I won't go down to what defines these things, but they obey, obey certain rules that then make this thing isometric. That is like one-to-one -one with quantum theory in the Hilbert, uh, Hilbert space formalism. Okay. So our question was, if I throw in Pat's recovery map into this QPR thing, what do I get? After a lot of math, okay, what you get is this monster, okay? Uh, but it's not super difficult to kind of look into. Um, just take note that there's this, how you define these kind of state dependent uh, matrices is as follows. Okay, so what on earth is this thing? Just notice that there's these frame operators and dual operators that define the QPR feature here. The important thing is to put them side by side, right? This quantum Bayesian inference, we, or in, the, in terms of the PETS map, transform into QPR. And then here we have classical Bayesian inference. Once you kind of put this side by side, we notice some similarities already, right? But we can massage the thing, okay, to make it even more obvious, okay? For one thing, I'm gonna, these are diagonal uh, matrices down here. I'm gonna just square them and put a square root here. Okay, just so that it uh, kind of one to, um, maps over to this matrix power that's down here. And once you do that, and I kind of write the entries of this d squared, um, what you'll notice is that we can write it like this, right? Okay. And we put this side by side, and you kind of stare at it hard enough, um, you'll notice that what you have is that if the frame operators and uh, dual operators are now collapsed as projectors in the same basis, we get exactly classical base rules. Okay. So that's that's interesting. Um, essentially, the Q, the QPR version of pets, the pets map collapses to classical Bayesian reasoning when we neglect complementarity or the principle of superposition. Okay. So all the same, classical Bayes rule and the PETS map can be compared using QPR and the uh, QPR of the PETS collapses to be classical Bayes rule when it's reduced to one basis. Um, and uh, this strongly suggests that the PETS recovery map is a kind of quantum generalization of the classical Bayes rule. Okay. So for more on this, you can read uh, PR, this PRX quantum paper um, that is already out. All right, so one last snapshot and I'm done. Okay. So for some of us who are studying uh, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, you might be surprised that I haven't mentioned these fluctuation uh, relations, right? So some of us might be thinking, okay, I don't have no idea what a fluctuation theorem is. Okay, so um, I won't get, get into too much of the weeds here, but you can kind of think of them as generalizations of the second law. Um, and what's very nice about these things is that they essentially just compare a forward and reverse process, some statistics down here. And what you can get is that even though you do not assume very strong thermodynamic assumptions like quasi-static transformations or the target system is very large, like a very big, uh, very big particle number or something like that. Even though you don't assume these things, you can still get very nice statements about thermodynamic quantities like the change in free energy. So even though it's very loose in terms of assumptions, you still get very concrete statements about uh, these thermodynamic uh, quantities. And essentially, um, what you want to do if you want to kind of exploit this fluctuation relation is to really check um, if you can plot a line graph for the log of this object, this entropy production term, and uh, against W, some kind of work term that you are doing to the target system. And um, there's lots of very interesting experiments that are done that you wouldn't expect to obey this, this fluctuation theorem, but they do. Okay, for example, like this rotor protein in some kind of, you know, in a wet environment, is this is fluctuation theorem. And uh, a nanosphere kind of being bombarded by photons, um, you know, just kind of moving around. Even that also uh, obeys this Crookes fluctuation theorem. And you're able to mix the objects down here. So, Having said that, the derivations for this thing tend to be quite nightmarish okay, about understanding how you understand fluctuation relations. There are some derivations that are much simpler, but the earlier ones were very, very difficult uh, to understand. They were invoke things like thermostats, multiple buffs, um, like dissipative functions in the Hamiltonian and things like that. And one of the things that my boss, Valerio, okay, and a uh, collaborator from uh, University of Nagoya did was try to make everything simple. Okay, basically they say that, okay, let's not en embed a physical definition throughout the derivation. Let's try to split it as much as we can. Okay, that we, we, derivation tries to approach it such that we kind of split the physicality of the scenario, like for example, with regard to the environment, and we kind of 
encode it into the reference prior, and everything else we just keep it as Bayesian reasoning, logic basically. Okay, and they do this in this uh, paper. I think it was twenty twenty one, and basically try to separate this physics and from the parts that are just logic and derivation. Okay, and um, kind of quantum fluctuation relations uh, are also done, but with regard to the pets. Okay, but that's not super important here right now. So once a paper like this is published, uh, you might start to think, okay, if it's true that I can really separate these physical um, physical things, physical assumptions into the reference prior, and everything else is just Bayesian reasoning and statistics, then it's very natural to think that, okay, then can I apply fluctuation relations to non-physics scenarios, right? Um, essentially, can I plot a fluctuation relations graph for a scenario that has, quote unquote, nothing to do with physics? Okay, what do I need? I just need some kind of thought process, something that I do in a stochastic context. Don't think of a physical environment, but some kind of stochastic context that's affecting some uh, target that is being brought to some initial state to some final state, right? And there is some kind of parameter that fluctuates because of this part, this stochastic context. That sometimes when I do the thing, it's easier because of the the context helps me. Sometimes I do the thing and it's harder, for example. You can think of it this way. And for the reverse process, I just do the opposite of the first thing that I was doing in the same stochastic. So a question that we asked was that what non-physics scenario could we invoke in this situation to kind of model this thing? Okay, and I thought very hard and I had a kind of a brain fart okay, in some sense. And I, um, I'm not very smart. So I thought of, I thought of Uno. Yeah. So I thought of UNO, right? So um, I'm not going to explain the, the, the rules of UNO here, but basically it's a game whereby you're trying to lose cards and you will have different hand sizes at different times. But because of how your friends are playing and how random the play deck is, um, it's going to affect the time or like the amount of deck interactions that you're going to have to get there, basically. Okay. So notice then we have Okay, and of course, yes, it's UNO, but we can use some big words to describe it, like an extensive form game with moves by nature, or non-Markovian correlated environment to describe my friends, right? Okay, but basically, uh, it's UNO, it's a card game, right? And so what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to run a stress. Um, for example, if I get a certain card, I will always play it last because it will help me with, with regard to future events. But I'll do the opposite of that when, when I'm doing the reverse process. That once I get it, I play it immediately. Okay. So in some sense, this one is the one that I want to win. This one is the one I want to torture my friends and keep, keep the game running forever okay. as far as I can. Okay. And X and Y, I'm going to put it as my hand sizes. And W, I'm going to put as deck interactions. How many times I'm going to put down a card or pick up a card. I'm going to take that as my work. So this is a kind of a joke project, right? Okay. And we gave it to a... Uh, a, a high school student that was looking for an enrichment project kind of gave it to him like uno logical fluctuation theorems or something like that <laughs> and and this kid like he is really really he was really into it and i think he really did his best he's he's better at coding than me that's for sure okay and he plotted the graphs and none of us were expecting anything we were expecting some nonsense okay but what we got was this okay so it's not linear okay but there are there are regimes that are very line like right there's some kind of behavior here that is kind of like crooks okay do i do i have any model for this every time i think i have a model for it i immediately find, find myself being wrong about it uh, later on when i'm on the commute home or something okay and there are other more enigmatic graphs for certain transitions that we can't figure out just yet okay i'm not going to explain this because i don't understand it myself okay but what is being said here is that currently we are looking into connecting game theoretic settings to the study of reverse processes and stochastic thermodynamics in general and how one can elucidate others in particular are uh, there some games that we can kind of model and play that can model thermal environments help us increase our understanding of them in some ways okay so let me summarize and close a generalized recipe for reverse processes can be found in the classical base rule and the pets recovery map, which can be seen as a quantum analog as expressed by this QPR um, model. And uh, this approach has been fruitful in several ways. For one thing, it recovers nice intuitions uh, about the role and information and updating, and it coheres with the rule of dilations that we mentioned before. And lastly, it opens up the possibility of connecting some non-physics 
uh, settings such as games and like Uno, okay, to understand this sto sto stochastic thermodynamic. And so these are the people that uh, are working on this field in our group. And yeah, thank you very much.